we're going to begin looking at some non-Christian approaches to ethics. How do non-Christians deal with questions of right and wrong? Okay, we're assuming here that we're talking about those who believe in ethics, that there really is a right or wrong. I'm not going to address postmodernists who basically say that there is no right or wrong, that it's all relative, that it doesn't matter what you do. We're looking at approaches that basically try to say that there is a right and a wrong. So first is the idea that our life is just following a list of laws, a list of rules, do's and don'ts. Okay, ethics is just doing the right thing, no real reference to the gospel. If you want to know what's right and wrong, right is just following rules, wherever those rules might come from, whether from tradition, religious writings, or wherever, and wrong is not following those rules. Now, philosophically, Immanuel Kant basically held to this perspective called a deontological approach. Right meant following his categorical imperative. Now you're not going to run into too many students or parents who consciously hold to Kant's view, but I wanted you to know that this is a standard philosophical approach. But basically all religions except Christianity fall into this camp. They all come down to do this and don't do that. And the focus is works righteousness. That is, we gain our stature, our standing, our acceptance before God through what we do. We hope our good works outweigh our sins. We hope that we're better than the average. You know, I'm better than most people around me. If we do enough good works, however that might be determined, we're accepted by God. Now, some examples of this are Judaism, apart from Christ, Islam, and many of the cults. Now, there are some negative results of works righteousness, two main ones. First, this feeds man's pride. That is, man is deceived into believing he keeps these commandments perfectly. You know, I think I'm good in and of myself. Look what I've done. I can be deceived into believing I keep the laws better than I actually do. You know, I hear about different groups who teach that man can become sinless in this life. But they end up redefining sin downward and deceiving themselves. And they fashion the laws in such a way that they can keep them. But second is the opposite effect. That is, this leads to despair. When I see what the rules really are, I'm without hope. I can't keep the laws completely. And man innately knows this based on Romans 1. Man knows that God requires obedience and that they've fallen short. When have I done enough good works? Does one time of helping an old lady across the street unweigh one time of kicking the cat? I can't measure up. I have no way of knowing that I'm good enough. So this is one approach to ethics. The next is the approach of utilitarianism, which is taught philosophically by John Stuart Mill and more recently by Joseph Fletcher. Now, this is just a fancy way of saying the end justifies the means. If the results are good, you've done good, no matter what you've done. If lying makes someone feel better, then lying in that case was good. If killing an unborn child keeps an unwed mother from committing suicide, then killing the child is good. If sleeping with my neighbor's wife makes her happy, then that's a good thing. You see, this is basically a situational ethic. What's right and wrong depends entirely on the situation. In one situation, lying might be good. In another situation, it might be wrong. There's no absolute right or wrong, just what fits the situation. Or another way of saying this is that we act so as to result in the greatest pleasure for the greatest number. So when I try to decide what's right and what's wrong, it's not just a matter of being selfish. I'm doing what's best for me, no matter who it hurts. Instead, I should think about the possible results of my actions and decide which action will bring pleasure for the most people. So good is whatever brings pleasure to the most people, and evil is what hinders that idea. Either it doesn't benefit many people or it harms people. Now, this is purely a results-oriented focus. What are the results or outcomes of my actions? Good results mean my actions are good. Bad results tell me my actions are bad. But there's several problems with this focus. First, it assumes that everyone seeks or wants pleasure. 
My going up and punching someone else in the nose will hurt him, and that wouldn't be bringing him pleasure. But what if he's a masochist and enjoys being hurt? Does that then, then make it right for me to punch him in the nose? So this leads to the next objection. Should we seek pleasure? What about the concept of self-sacrifice? I give myself up, even being willing to die for someone else. Now, I'm not talking here about sacrificing myself for a large group, like the captain going down with the ship, but for one person. Let's say I see a small child walking in front of a speeding car. I might run and push him out of the way and save him, but sacrifice myself in the process. But now many people are going to feel pain because of that. My wife would be a widow. The school would be without an academic dean, although you might think that would be pleasurable. You see what I'm saying? I save one child, but many people feel pain. Is that good? Now, I think people would generally agree that's a good thing to do, but it doesn't fit with the greatest good for the greatest to number equation. Finally, we can't really calculate pleasure and pain. Take the example of the child in the car. After I save that child, he might grow up to find a cure for cancer, or settle the Israeli-Palestinian problem, or something like that. That would mean my death resulted in a great good. But perhaps that child grows up to be another Hitler. That would mean my death results in pain for many. I can't know that at the time, though, so there's no way for me to know if it's a good thing to sacrifice myself or not. Well, what about other actions? You can take them from the extreme. What if an action makes four people moderately happy, but makes three people extremely unhappy? Does that tip the balance one way or the other? Or, I'm the president at the end of World War II, and I have to decide whether to drop the atomic bomb. Dropping it will kill many Japanese, including civilians, but I don't really know how many because the real effects of the bomb aren't yet known. But not dropping it, will probably result in the deaths of many Americans and Japanese in a protracted land battle. Do I just count bodies to determine what's right? You see, pure utilitarianism just doesn't work. You have no way to know what you should do. Well, another non-Christian approach is existentialism. In the history of philosophy, this was taught by Jean-Paul Sartre and Soren Kierkegaard. Existentialism teaches that nothing should be decided based on someone else's authority or influence. Good actions are those which are carefully and freely chosen, not those which I do just because someone else tells me to do or because someone else influences me. Let's say you see a poor person who genuinely needs some money. You think, I don't want to help this guy but I'll do it because my pastor's over there on the other side of the street watching me, and I want him to think well of me. Now, is that a good act? Not really. I mean, we would say you're not helping him because you want to. You're doing it out of duty or just to get someone else to think well of you. It's like if I give my wife a dozen roses for Valentine's Day, and when she thanks me, I say, just doing my job, ma'am. Okay. Am I going to have a pleasant evening after that? Now, Sartre's point was that our decisions must be freely made, out, completely free of outside coercion or influences if they're going to be good. When I choose something just because I want to do it, that's a good action. So there's some problems here. First, what about when my free choice conflicts with your free choice? I freely choose to eat the last piece of cake, and you freely choose to eat it as well. Who wins? Or, I freely choose to kill my neighbor. Does that do anything to his free choices? See, existentialism provides no standard at all. There's nothing to tell me what's right or wrong. In fact, that's the point of existentialism. It's obvious, though, we can't live that way. If I freely choose to give money to a beggar, that's good. If I freely choose to kick him in the face, that's good also. Now, I went to an educational seminar at Covenant College a few years ago with Howard Gardner of uh, Multiple Intelligences fame as a speaker. Okay, it was a fascinating day. He had a lot of interesting and challenging things to say. One of his sessions was about his work over the past 15 or so years dealing with good work. 
He and his colleagues engaged in research involving about 1,100 in-depth interviews with all kinds of people seeking to find what is good. This is basically an empirical study. Examine what's the case among people and draw conclusions from that research about what's good. Gardner said there are three basic criteria for good based on his study. These are things that the people have agreed on that make something good. First, something is good if it's of high quality. He calls this the expert test. Do experts in the field think you've done something good? If I, as a teacher, get my children to learn math by wiring their chair with electrodes and shock them when they give a wrong answer, is that good? Well, expert educators would say no. Second, good actions are those for which you feel a sense of responsibility. Can you look at yourself in the mirror and like what you see when, you, when you've done it? If I steal money from the Coke machine at school, can I look at myself in the mirror and honestly say that I did good? Probably not. Third, good actions are those which just feel right. It's intrinsically satisfying or motivating. I mean, if you go out and work for Habitat for Humanity, build a house, you get a feeling of having done good. You're satisfied with that. Now, you know, there's some problems with Gardner's approach. First, his empirical approach commits the is-ought fallacy. This is a common issue in ethics. You can't argue from what is to what ought to be. You see, in our country in the 1950s, I could say that Jim Crow was the accepted way of life in the South. But did that make it right? I'm sure many white people at the time could give expert reasons for segregation, they probably felt good about themselves for keeping the races pure. But that says nothing about whether it's right or not. You can't derive ethics purely from an examination of the facts. Second, his research is actually circular in nature. Here's a quotation from a website at Stanford University that summarized their process. They said, since its inception, Researchers at the Good Works Project interviewed over 700 leading practitioners and approximately 100 young workers in a range of professions including journalism, genetics, theater, jazz, law, business, dance, philanthropy, martial arts, and higher education. Here's the key. We focused on individuals who exemplify the understanding of good work that the Good Works Project has developed. They're recognized as experts in the professional area. They attempt to act in ways that are socially and morally responsible, and they find personal meaning in their work. End of quotation. Now notice what's happening here. They determined these three characteristics of good work. Then they looked for people who had those three characteristics and interviewed them and used the interviews as evidence for, to support their definition of good work. This, by the way, is always the problem in sociological research. You tend to interview people who are already on your side. Okay, third, there really is no standard here for decisions at all. Okay, think several years back, economic crisis. I might have been a crooked accountant with Enron. Experts in the field might have said that I was very effective at cooking the books. I could look at myself in the mirror and be satisfied because I know that my cover-up of Enron's finances were keeping the company afloat and avoiding massive layoffs. So it felt right. I was comfortable with it. I sincerely believed I was doing good. Now, in the seminar I went to, Gardner used Enron as an example of bad work. But that just means there is no standard. I can make just as cogent an argument that it was good. Gardner likes to contrast extremes. He'll pit Mother Teresa against Hitler and show that we can all agree Mother Teresa was good and Hitler was evil. Well, what about something in the middle? Let's say in our current political context, Hillary Clinton versus Chris Christie. Now, that's not as clear-cut. You see, I, I don't think we would put Hillary Clinton as evil on the par with Hitler. And Gardner wouldn't call Hillary Clinton good on the par with Mother Teresa. One member of the audience questioned him on this. How can he ground what he says if he does not believe in a God outside himself, which Gardner acknowledged? 
he just gave some more criteria. He said good works are those that are done transparently. We don't have to hide them. Good works are not just for our self-interest. But now, why are these good criteria? Why is promoting my self-interest bad? Aren't there times when we don't want our good works to be known? Like we're giving charity to someone, for example. He ended up bringing it all down to one issue as an overriding concept. Tolerance. That's his bedrock value. You can believe or do whatever you want as long as you're tolerant. Now, his tolerant is not just being civil or cordial. It's saying that all beliefs and values are acceptable. He, just, he talked about a panel discussion he had went, gone to where the panelists were Christians and they vigorously disagreed about things like gay rights and abortion. He said they were ready to kill each other. Now, I wasn't at that conference, but I can guarantee no one was ready to kill each other. But he was upset because people were saying there was right and wrong, and the wrong disagreed with his own views, what harm are gays causing. Anyway, that's a current view of ethics, the empirical ethics, and Howard Gardner is very influential, so that's why I brought him up. Now, there are two things that I would like for you to do. First, there's going to be a brief quiz that I'd like for you to take. This will just ask you just to summarize the three main or the four main uh, philosophies you've looked at. I'd also like you on the discussion board to think of other examples of ways that you see these methods of ethics acting out, whether it's your own students' views or your views. Think of examples of ways that you have seen one of these views of ethics.